And now we'll offer you our recommendations. Our key recommendation is that Shaughnessy Heights United Church, with the help of BC Conference, seek the appointment of a trained, experienced interim minister to lead the congregation in an intentional process of transitional ministry for the next two years. That, um, that's the, the main recommendation, here's fleshing it out. That Chuck, during this interim ministry time, focus on the following. Engage the congregation in discerning and developing a new sense of Shaughnessy Heights United Church's identity and mission with the understanding that this refreshed sense of purpose is what will shape future staffing, ministry programs, governance structure, and budget priorities. This work might include exploring the congregation's demographics and placing them alongside those of the neighborhoods, looking at Chuck's worship life, including the role of music and singing in the total worship experience, getting an accurate picture of the congregation's human and financial resources, clarifying the purpose of the manse and how the church will address the needs of tenants, whether ministers or renters, reaching out to other congregations or community agencies to explore how you might cooperate in the future. Another sub-recommendation or focus of uh, the interim ministry recommendation is to engage the congregation in establishing healthy methods of communication with a view to ensuring that at Shuck there will be an atmosphere of trust, respect, and openness. This work might include setting norms and practicing healthy communications, implementing processes and training for the resolution of conflicts, developing effective responses to difficult behaviors when the need arises, creating a culture of celebration for the efforts and the achievements of volunteers and staff. That eventually you would update your staffing model and articulate the roles and responsibilities of both staff and volunteers, including how supervision occurs. This work should also include developing a careful profile of the characteristics and qualities that will best fit for your key leadership positions. For example, we heard words like collaborative leadership style, a consensus builder versus a strong leader who leads from the front. We're going to segue for a moment here into a little bit more of you hear us talking about interim ministry and there are a number of you that may be wondering what that's about. What is unique about interim ministry? Interim ministry gives a congregation a chance to look freshly and deeply at itself in the knowledge and love of God. This form of ministry creates a two-year time and space for the congregation to ask all those big questions that every congregation needs to consider from time to time, including, who are we now? How are we different from who we were five, 10, or 20 years ago? How are we the same? How has our neighborhood changed? And how are we reacting or responding to the, that reality? What fresh opportunities are we being presented with now? The focus of interim ministry is always on the future. It is designed to both a challenge and equip a congregation to answer as open, openly and honestly as possible such questions as, what of our current ministry and mission is God calling us to do differently in the next few years? And what is God calling us to retain? What ministries should be expanded, enhanced, or changed? And what is God calling us to leave behind? Folks, uh, this part of the report is based on uh, common questions that people in congregations always ask when they're talking about interim ministry. 
So here's the next typical question. Why do congregations choose to engage in interim ministry? There are many reasons why a congregation might choose to engage in interim ministry. A congregation that has had several pastor relationships that have not gone well. The congregation recognizes that there is a pattern which needs to be examined and changed. Sometimes it's a congregation in need of healing. Conflicts have arisen which have caused hurt and heartache. Key leaders recognize that things need to change so that decision-making is honest, open, and respectful, but they do not know how to achieve that goal. Key leaders in another congregation might recognize that their congregation has reached a crossroads, that there have been so many changes in the community around them. They wish they could go back to the way things used to be, but they know that's not possible but they're uncertain as to how best to prepare for the future. Sometimes we have interim ministries where a much valued minister retires after 10 or even 20 or more years service in the same congregation. While the congregation is used to doing things in certain ways, they now need to consider other ways of doing both ministry and the mission. Sometimes it's a congregation that finds itself in crisis. Too many things have happened that no one could have foreseen. The congregation feels as if it somehow lost its moorings. What do congregations say after completing interim ministry? Many of them report renewed energy, a clearer understanding of who we are now, who we are not, and that is helpful. We now have a more realistic sense of what our future options are. These are quotes, by the way. Another quote. Even if we aren't thrilled with all that is happening around us, we recognize more clearly that who we are and what we have is enough with God and in Christ. We now know that it is God who is leading us into the future no matter what transpires. We know we are not alone. We thought you might be interested to know where else interim ministry is currently happening. Communities in Faith out of Trail, BC. Sunnyside United Church in South Surrey. Knox United Church in Parksville. South Burnaby United Church in Burnaby. Powell River United Church, Powell River. St. John's United Church in Seashelt, BC. Here are some of the reasons why we think interim ministry is best for Swansea Heights United Church. Number one, you have told us clearly and consistently that Shuck cannot go on the way things are now. While you have named some things that you love and cherish about this place, you have also described things that cause your hearts to ache. You long for Shuck to be the very best that it can be but you need help to discern not only who you really are at this time, but also what it is that God is calling you to do together now as you look to your future. Some of you worry about your reputation as a congregation regarding your history of pastoral relationships. That's the relationships with your lead minister. If you decide to engage in interim ministry, this will be the work of the congregation, not just the council or the specially appointed transition team. After you have completed interim ministry, you will be known to have worked at your core challenges. Any ministers who wish to consider coming to Shuck will see the reporting of the work that you will have done. Those applicants will be able to see how you have grown, matured, and deepened your relationship with one another, with your staff, and with God. Some of you may wonder how the interim ministry will be any different from any of the other projects that you have engaged in before, or that nothing will happen. The difference with interim ministry is that it is the job of the interim minister 
with the help of the transition team to track those things, ensuring that the congregation makes progress towards the goals that it has set for itself. Some of you wonder how another interim ministry can be different from the last one you tried, which did not work out well for you or for the interim minister. What is different this time is that this interim ministry will come about as a result of what you, the congregation, have named as your delights and your core challenges. Also, BC Conference is promising to work with you to help you find the best fit possible regarding an interim minister. We will also help you get the interim ministry established and will be there in the background should you require any further help. Our final remarks, and then I'm going to go up in the chancel and I'm going to get a little box that contains copies of this report so that we can distribute it and then we can uh, be in conversation with any questions you have. But our final remarks. Your commitment and your dedication to Shuck is amazing. Your response to and your participation in the listening team process are perfect examples of this. We firmly believe that you have what you need here to thrive and to be successful. And we want you to hear that. We believe in you. There are skills and capacities that must be nurtured and that they must be developed in order to facilitate that success. But we are convinced that you have the ability to make that happen. BC Conference will be here to support you every step of the way. God bless Shaughnessy Heights United Church and the future of your ministry together. Folks, we're going to give you copies of what we wrote. Uh, we're fairly aware that we're not going to get any prize for brilliant writing. And even this morning, we were making corrections in the text. So uh, if you were to listen to the record of this event and then read the report, you may see that a few words are a bit different. Some of you will have questions. Some of you will have concerns. Some of you will want to sit for a minute. Mark and I are prepared to stay this morning to do whatever we can to answer your questions or concerns. So please don't hesitate to comment or to ask. Does anyone just raise a hand if you need a copy? Okay, I see a hand there. There's another one too. Great. So Molly and I have said a lot. Uh, the majority of that is in the report. Some of it, you might have seen us switching documents. Some of it was being, uh, we were sharing with you some pieces from a, a document on interim ministry that Molly has written. Um, and we can make that full document available to you. We'd be happy to make copies of that and, and distribute that uh, in, in a later time. But now, we just want to open things up and allow you to just ask questions or to just, if you've got anything that you want to ask us about. What we will do is if you do speak, um, just identify with your hand and then we'll uh, ask you, do we have a microphone by any chance for people? I'm just wondering. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. What we'll do is we'll ask you to give your name, and then we'll repeat the question. If if um, yeah, if people have trouble hearing. Um, concern that I want to express, and I think it's sort of an important piece of background information. Um, I looked at uh, some figures on our membership and our active membership, and the numbers to me were quite surprising. We did a, if you remember, we published a membership booklet, in, in I gotta look at my, my notes here, uh, We've done two different ones recently. Um, one was in 2001, and the second one was in 2013. And what I looked at is what I thought was active membership as opposed to the role. And when I looked at, act when I looked at these booklets, sort of the definition I used was that those people that were inter interested enough to have their name and their picture in the book really represented uh, the people who were interested in the church and perhaps active in the church as, to, as opposed to try and work on the roles, which we all know have so many other people that many of them never even show up. Anyway, the figures for 2001 was that the, in my definition of active, active membership, was 266, and the equivalent number for 213 was 162. And I, I, when I looked at through the booklet, I didn't count children. These are adult members who were interested enough to participate in being in the book. When you look at that, what it shows that the shrinkage of our adult membership in that period of time was 39%. And that figure really surprised me. And really what concerns me is that we're getting, when I look around, we're getting close to what's, what's a viable uh, population. And to be, un, to be dramatic, if you applied that same rate of shrinkage over the next 10 years, we'd be down to a mature membership of 99 people. And when I look in the mirror and see my gray hair, and when I look around and look at the population here, that's probably not a bad prediction. So it is a structural problem. This is a forward-looking exercise. It's a sort of a structural problem that has to be a major part of where we're going for the future. Does anyone have any questions or? Can I gracefully sit down? Thank you. I appreciate okay. that. And you, okay. you, and what was your name, by the way? Uh, Jim McWilliams. Jim McWilliams. Thank you. Okay, Jim. Um, Jim, thank you for articulating something that was shared uh, with us by a number of you, right, regarding the demographics. What happens when we come to church and we see fewer and fewer of us that we've seen in the past? One of the things that the interim, our reason for recommending interim is that an aspect of that work is to look at what we can do as a community that is coming to lift up, to say yes to, and affirm the things that give us the most joy and hope and to be interacting in different ways with people, whether they're partnerships with other congregations or people in our neighborhood, other community agencies, um, to uh, make ourselves porous to the community. Um, their outreach is also very successful, and there are ways of uh, making yourselves available to the community through that already established ministry. So that is some of the work that we think um, would take place under your interim ministry. But Jim, I appreciate your mentioning that, because I know it's a concern that, that others of you share. Another question? And if you don't mind, please give your name, and then we'll... Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you do that? Thank you, uh, Tony Wheel. Um, I really appreciate the efforts that you've put forth in collecting information and also reporting it. Uh, my great concern is that as members of an organization like the United Church, you have a fairly limited menu of choices when it comes to dealing with a church like us. And uh, the menu of choices for interim seems to be 
it. Um, and frankly, uh, interim ministry in this church scares the hell out of me. Uh, we had a, a, I had a very bad experience uh, with our last interim ministry. And uh, regardless of how, how well intended uh, the process is, the, the interim ministry will include in the package an interim minister who will bring his personality or her personality uh, to the mix. And we really have to have the right person. Uh, what my question really is, what other choices do we have? Thank you very much. I heard you. Um, is there a way to turn this? Sorry. Thanks, Pamela. Um, I heard you say a couple of things. I heard you say that, um, that you, you, you believe that it's a fairly limited menu of, of choices for Shuck. You're wondering what your other options are. You're also feeling uh, that the congregation, it might scare the heck out of the congregation uh, to do that. And um, what was the final piece? Thank you. And so the, the, the concern about the fit, right? The right person, getting the right person. Uh, because the, whoever you get will have their own personality. Um, in terms of options, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of options, this is the option that we're recommending. We didn't just pull this out of nowhere. And we, in the panoply of, of menu of options of different things that are uh, alternatives or approaches that can be taken, this is the one that we have prayerfully and thoughtfully uh, selected as being appropriate. In fact, it basically selected itself. All of the conditions, all of the kind of hallmarks and features of what makes interim ministry appropriate are present and were named in large majority by the people that we spoke to. We're 100% confident of that. Fit is crucial. It's very important that you get the right person, whether it's an interim minister or any minister. We know that, don't we? So we, um, and maybe I'll let Molly speak a little bit more to that. Tony, thank you for, um, for naming what we expected to hear. We didn't know who it would come, and I appreciate your colorful language. Because we know that some of you have strong memories. It's only 10 years ago, right? Not that long ago. Um, just one thing I should add, and I'm not going to speak to the options piece because Mark's done that. There are actually very few interim ministers available. So even if you decide to go interim, and it will have to be your decision, you are currently in competition with other churches. So the interim ministers that are available, skilled, experienced, uh, are not only discerning whether they would be a good fit somewhere else, they're interviewing now, right, with other churches in BC and other conferences. The thing I think we mostly want to underline, Tony, is that we are extremely concerned that it be a good fit. And we see that as part of our job to work with you to make sure it is a good fit. We actually have heard the horror stories, both from the interim minister and from this congregation. So all, I think all we can say is what we've already said, is that um, you're stuck with us because we're going to be part of this journey too. And I don't think the conference was in a position to offer you those resources last time around. There was another piece as well, Tony, that I just, it may be true for some others of you, that this idea that it scares the heck out of you. And that's why I think even a decision itself is a process and that we want to be in conversation to try to get that out. So some of the conversations you shared with us when we were meeting in the listening team, you talked about the things that scare you, right? So if we're exploring this idea of interim ministry as a congregation, there need to be opportunities to talk about what it is that scares us. What do we think will happen? What are we afraid won't happen, right? What are the things that are going on? What happened last time that we don't want to happen again? What's lurking in there in our minds and our hearts? Let's get that out in front of us and let's talk about that because some of those things are gonna be um, structural, actual things that we, we need to address into whatever solution, and some of that could be just our feeling jumpy and apprehensive about what comes next. Yeah. Gordon Howe was hired on here as our minister. Most recently, he was hired on as an interim minister. 
I'm not talking about Gordon. <clears throat> I didn't think that you were. I didn't think that you were. Um, yeah. Charlotte Burns. Um, you're talking about a very democratic process. That is not our experience here. Um, the processes are that people are handpicked from the top. And uh, each group does not have a vote as to who they wish to represent them. And I think that's a fundamental problem that we do not have democracy here. Can I ask a clarifying question? When you're uh, talking about that, I'm presuming you to mean choice about the minister, or is it choice about the process of what happens next? Okay, so I'm just, I want to address the steps that we were recommending as moving towards interim. And what I was saying is that there would be conversation, in fact, I see in the bulletin, there's three evenings that are, or three opportunities in the next week, I believe, for you as a congregation to have conversations about that. And then Molly and I can also make ourselves available to be with you in the whole, um, is, I think as soon as next Sunday, I believe we checked our calendars, uh, if, if that would be helpful. But um, the process of how you move forward isn't an act of secrecy. It's not, an, nor is it, and I wanna be clear too, nor is it an act of um, parliamentary democracy. So for example, and I just say this because some folks um, have the idea that every constituency has to be represented or have an advocate at a table, whether that table is at a council or whether that uh, table is a search committee. And in fact, it doesn't work that way. What we do is we appoint people that we hope represents the, the demographics and most of the constituencies that aren't there to lobby they're not there to lobby for outreach. They're not there to lobby for the choir. They're in there to discern as a uh, system of colleagues on how to tend the whole. And I say this because that happens with search committees a lot, right? Some people feel like their voice won't be heard. But the way the search processes work, by definition, is to engage with the congregation to make sure that people have a chance to speak. And that's precisely what's just happened now. We've met with 99 of you. We've listened, listened very, very, very carefully to 99 of you. And we have in integrated and incorporated this information. And this is what has come to the surface, is what we think will serve the best. What sort of process we move through from here, I guarantee will be faithful and it will be inclusive and it will provide an opportunity for people to contribute um, their wisdom, okay? Mark, we have about 10 minutes. Okay, we've got 10 minutes. Folks, um, Tony, I, I wonder if I could ask you if, you, if you'd be willing to articulate um, a little more what it is you might fear. Can, because I think I, folks will have, have heard your, your comments and I, we can't be at any of your three um, things during the next week. So I'd just love to hear what's the hardest thing. Okay, I, I'm talking about me now because I, I can't talk for the congregation. Uh, my opinion of the next previous uh, interim minister was that she felt uh, charged to somehow or other fix us. And uh, I don't think this congregation needs fixing. I think what we need is a, a loving pastor, uh, somebody who appreciates us, uh, somebody who we feel comfortable with, uh, somebody we care about. Um, you know, the intellectual stuff, the um, wonderful sermons, they're all important, but they're really a fringe benefit. Um, if, we, if, we, if we feel loved and appreciated, we're going to be very happy. I think, frankly, right now, I feel loved and appreciated by our leadership, and I think things are really good. Um, so I, I really don't see... I, what scares me is that somebody is going to in, try and influence and bring us to some place we don't want to go. And uh, that's, uh, it, it's really been compounded by uh, the comfort I feel right now. Whoops. Falling into the funeral. 
furniture is not recommended. Tony, thank you for the clarity uh, and your openness and your honesty. Um, I heard you saying that you're grateful for the way things are going currently, that, that there has been a shift. It sounds like there's a different atmosphere, um, people are breathing differently, and um, we heard others say something close to it would be nice to be loved. Uh, we heard it would, nice to be, it would be nice to be respected just for who we are. Um, I'm a five-time interim minister, and I get to interview the people because I'm on the conference interim ministry committee um, who get to be designated or not as interim ministers. Um, every time they go through one, they get evaluated by us and redesignated. It, they get redesignated every five years, but they do an exit interview with the conference interim ministry committee. And Mark and I have heard very clearly what you've said and know that that would be really critical to the good fit question. Would this person genuinely respect you? Would that person care about you? The other thing we would be looking for is not someone who's super clear about what you should do, because only you can answer that question. You may have heard us say that the work of interim ministry is that of the congregation. I don't know the details of your previous experience 10 years ago, but this is your work, and that's good news and maybe bad news for some of you in that, but it will be the congregation's work so the person's job will be to lead you in an engaging process. And the outcome will be yours. The person may have their own personal opinions, but that doesn't matter because it's you all that will de would be determining the future. I'm looking at the clock. We have, what, two minutes, Pamela? And I really did also three. just want to underscore that point, that an interim ministry is not a cookie cutter. It's not a person with a hard hat that swings in with uh, you know, a wrecking ball and, and wants to just make it their way and turn you into something you're not. That is precisely, absolutely the opposite of what this is about. This is a person who comes in and senses, first of all, establishes relationships with you, gets to know who you are, what is important to you, what do you care about, what are the essential pieces of this place. And having done that, engages you in conversations about where you might be going next. They don't have an agenda except to help you succeed in the things that you do the best and want to do more of. That's absolutely what it is. Whether it's an interim minister or any other leader, not even in the churches, that comes in and sacks Rome and starts to recreate it in their own image, yeah, we don't want any of that, none of us do, and that's not what you're going to get, okay? Other questions? I see a hand there, thank you. My name's An Andrew Hames. Uh, in BC Conference's opinion, who manages the church? Is it the lead minister or is it council? Um, so in the United Church, the short answer, which may not address your question, is that we are in ministry together. So in terms of whether it's accountability, it depends on the relationship. Um, the minister is accountable to the board of uh, the church through the MNP committee. Um, the board is accountable to the congregation because they're appointed by the congregation. Um, the congregation is accountable to presbytery in terms of its well-being. The minister is accountable to conference in terms of oversight and discipline. And so ministers are in a covenanted relationship. In addition to being in an employment relationship, they form a covenant and then you see a minister come and we have a ceremony and presentation of symbols and what we're doing is we're covenanting with them in that relationship. So it's marble, there's no, it's not like a business where the buck stops at the CEO and uh, we have something like that. It really, and one of the recommendations is that we articulate governance here because I think your question expresses a lack of clarity about who, who's the boss and in what situations and, and when. Okay, and we think that's part of the work that would be helpful here, Chuck. I saw one other hand over there, or another one there. If we've got time, I know we're running out. Hello, my name is Phyllis Hayter, and what I would like to say is that since Pamela has been in charge, 
the services have been more interesting and I have left the church with um, much, uh, much, I take more out of the service than I have done in the 30 years that I've been here. I think Pamela's very good and she, she is doing a really good job. I, I'm here at the hospital, at, at the hospital, at the church um, quite often and I see that she goes out to visit and when she greets people and when she says goodbye, I haven't seen that before in any of the ministers that have been here. So I think Pamela's great and I hope she can stay. Thank you very much. We hope that Pamela can stay too. And we want to make clear that when we're talking about an interim ministry, we're talking about a person that comes for 24 months, works with you on all of the different goals that you will form together and then leaves. There's with no plans, no intention, no conversation at all that there would be a, a change in uh, Pamela's, um, situ uh, Pamela's employment. And the details of how that relationship with an interim minister and what Pamela's role would be is something that would be uh, worked out, okay? Thank you. So we, Mark, uh, we just we have to leave in about a minute and a half. Okay, sorry about that. It's the longest. Minute Hi, time. my name is Karen Medor, and I guess my my feeling at the moment, I just would like to follow up what the previous speaker said, is that even thinking of an interim minister right now is too soon, and I would like to see personally, and I don't know, I get the feeling maybe the congregation feels the same way, is that if we need time with Pamela to work things through a bit more, not thinking of an interim minister at this time. Am I okay there? Okay. Folks, we know that we all need to go. You all need to go. Mark and I are prepared to stick around for a bit if you want more comments coming our way or more questions. I'm not sure where that should be. You'll know where we should go. You get to tell us where to go. And, um, <laughs> Folks, thank you for your time. Thank you for your minds and your hearts and your faith. So thank just be to God and bless you all. Just uh, to hold on for one more minute, I, we just wanted to make sure uh, that we take a moment to thank these two for the work and the discernment that they've taken.